Academy of Poltergeist. I've been looking forward to this session all weekend. I love all the scary, gooey stuff. Uh, and it is brought to you by someone you probably know already as editor of The Skeptic. Uh, please find your seats, put your hands together, please, for next presenter, Deborah Hyde. Good morning, everybody. Of course, of course you recognise me. Of course you do. I was on the losing team at the Cosmic Shambles quiz on Friday. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Your pity means a great deal to me. Thank you so much. Right. Here we have the history, the strange history of the poltergeist. Before I start talking about supernatural creatures, I like to kind of get a temperature of the room which is your preferred supernatural creature. So if you generally prefer vampires, go <laughs> now. That's, that's quite a good vampire fan base here. And if you generally prefer werewolves, can you go Arr! now? Ah, they're as popular as ever. And if you generally prefer zombies, can you please say, I voted Trump? <laughs> or, uh, oh, sorry, wrong country, wrong country, isn't it? Anyway, yes, um, you, please do join me um, on Twitter. I'm at Jordamain, or the website is deborahyde.com. And as Helen said, I am editor of The Skeptic. So, let's get on to the poltergeists. But first of all, we're going to have ghost quizzes. I don't know if you know about most of my talks, but I make you do half the work. So whenever you see this sign, there is going to be a ghost after it. I want you to shout out the name of the ghost or the name of the intellectual property that it comes from, the kind of the program or the film or whatever. So, you ready? Here is your first ghost of the morning. Harry Potter, yeah, it was Nearly Headless Nick. There he is. So, poltergeists, what do poltergeists do? Well, they have noises, knockings, or footsteps. It's interesting because poltergeists don't just affect our perceptions. They don't just happen in our heads. The puzzling thing about them, the problematic thing about them from a psychical research point of view, is that they interact with matter out in the real world. So you've got knockings and footsteps. You've got telekinesis, things moving. Uh, there's the disappearance of small objects and their rediscovery later. That's interesting to me because the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was um, actually uh, a way of trying to get shysters who were presenting their, their skills as being real. And one of the, the things that they used to do, especially in inns, roadside inns or something like that, was to nick your luggage. And then you would have to hire a local specialist, a witch, a cunning man, a special person with special powers, and they would tell you where your luggage was. So it was basically, it was a, it was a con, a, you know, it was a whole con scheme. Um, and the 1735 Act was the first kind of rational witchcraft act in this country, and it recognised that. So poltergeists do this as well. They nick things, just proving that uh, they have two rackets on the go. Um, they cause major disasters, such as, ice, uh, such as arson as well, so it can get pretty dangerous being around a poltergeist. Now, it might surprise you to know that one of the first uses of the word that we have is from Martin Luther. Martin Luther, as we know, was very fond of starting lists. Thank you, Andy, for the tea. I'm a bit dependent. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, Martin Luther wrote lists, one of which started off the Reformation. He wrote another list as well. It was 114 complaints against the Catholic Church. Um, he did have more, but he ran out of paper. <laughs> Thank Christ for A4 is all I can say. Uh, so and on the fifth of these complaints was the complaint of poltergeists. He wasn't complaining that they actually existed. He was complaining that the church promoted belief in them, and then empowered themselves by providing the rights to get rid of them. So what he was saying was that it was a nonsense that was dreamt up to empower other people. But nonetheless, it meant that we have a word for this kind of entity. <coughs> Interestingly, he used other words for ghosts uh, in the same essay. 
Um, there are Manes and Lamia and all these different kinds of ghosts that other people have in different languages. Interesting that we only have one in ours, which means that we tend to kind of, um, because your language reflects your cognitive processes, it might mean that we kind of lump together a load of phenomena uh, in one, under one category in English. The word became popularized in the 19th century by a lady called Catherine Crow. She was a successful playwright, but she wrote um, a very readable book uh, called The Night Side of Nature. Um, and she included poltergeist mediums and poltergeist ghosts and all sorts of things. It was a collection of, of folklore, if you like, of folklore and tales and allegedly correct um, eyewitness accounts. Uh, and the 19th century, as you remember, was a big time for this kind of thing. And then it was promoted mostly in the 20th century. The way that it comes to us, really, is the earliest 20th century. There was a young woman called Eleanor Zugan who was a Romanian, and she ended up under the care of Harry Price, the famous psychical researcher. <coughs> she manifested various poltergeist uh, phenomena, um, and uh, it, it was, I mean, you know, she was a trickster. I'm sorry if that's spoiled the punchline for anybody here. Um, and the other thing that's very strange, I don't know if you, will be, uh, if you will be alarmed to find this out as I was, is that she later became a successful hairdresser. <laughs> what can you say? Now, this is a quote from The Kingdom of Darkness by Nathaniel Crouch. What I'm going to do today in this talk is I'm not going to just go through an exhaustive list of all of the poltergeist accounts that you can read in any 70s um, lurid paperback. You've all read them. They're very easily available. What I'm going to try and do is to, is to sort of show really that um, the things that poltergeists do can be attributed to different cultural phenomena, depending on where you are. And specifically that what we think of as poltergeists from kind of the 19th century onwards, those poltergeist phenomena, would have been attributed to witchcraft earlier in history. The 16th and 17th centuries in England, well, in Europe in general, were the height for the witch craze. That didn't mean that there were witch trials at all times and at all places, but it certainly was a rather dangerous place to be on the margins of society, a dangerous place and time. So the Kingdom of Darkness um, emphasizes this. There are witches, so there are many times the causes of these strange disturbances, which are in houses caused by evil spirits. This was kind of a lurid paperback of its day. It was a chapbook type thing. And Nathaniel Crouch, also known as Richard Burton, uh, wrote the equivalent of lurid 70s paperbacks. And what he's saying is that these phenomena, which exist, um, are caused by devils invoked by witches. So there you have a, a putative mechanism. Later on, the mechanism changed. By the time we were getting um, in, in Europe, we were getting the Enfield poltergeist, the Amityville horror, that kind of thing. What you would have is you would have the sense, actually, no, the Amityville horror was more of a, 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 a demonic manifestation. But with, you would get the sense that there weren't demons because it wasn't fashionable to believe in demons and devils, but that there was some kind of force there was, that could be channeled through um, usually a young person, a young or distressed person, somebody going through puberty um, or, or somebody who was under some kind of special stress. So we have the same phenomena and different mechanisms attributed to them as time changes. It's worth remembering that Joseph Piton de Tornfort, who I mentioned in my vampires talk, was a botanist who went to a Greek island. And they suffered on that island what we would recognize as a poltergeist attack. There was uh, a poltergeist which knocked over um, items, knocked over containers, uh, which contained either wine or olive oil, which is disastrous either way, depending on your priorities. Uh, and it was making knocking and banging sounds and throwing pebbles and things like that. He very wryly mentions that uh, it bothered every house except the house in which they stayed because they didn't believe in it. And it was attributed to a type of Greek vampire called a vrikolakas. So in different contexts, these things have different names. This is another kind of um, Ludwig Lavate. He goes through the summary of the poltergeist uh, in the 16th century. And he says there have been in many ages which have utterly denied that there are spirits or strange sprites. Uh, he goes through how credulity was encouraged in the past. 
He gives an explanation for a lot of these phenomena, but he finishes off by saying that sprites and strange sights do sometimes appear. And in verily, um, many strange and marvelous things do happen. So that's normally, that's an exceptionalism that we as skeptics are used to with supernatural phenomena. They're going, oh yeah, of course, most of it, most of it you can attribute to this, you can attribute to that, makes perfect sense, but there are still the odd strange events that go on. Now for the the thing that we're, for the era that we're looking at, it'd be interesting to think about the religious history slightly. Basically, in England, we all know during the um, Reformation that uh, Henry VIII caused the Church of England to be formed. This was more of a political than the theological change, though. Um, the Church of England still had many Catholic rights by the time of the Civil War um, in the next century, uh, you had Puritans who were at the other end, they were sort of reformed Protestants, really back to basics, weren't very keen on the idea at all that there were any kind of supernatural uh, things still going on. They believed, of course, in supernatural and in history because they believed in the death of Jesus and all of the miracles that he performed. But for the Catholic Church, mysticism, miracles, um, bleeding statues, uh, these kinds of things still occurred every day. For, at the extreme end, the Puritans thought that the age of miracles was over. We now lived in a physical world, a kind of mechanistic world, if you like. And then in the middle, you would have people who really politically, they didn't want to, um, to give away the mysticism entirely, but they didn't want to live in it. And so this, these are the people in the middle, the kind of uh, Protestant nonconformists who are going to come up with most of, these most of these poltergeist stories. Next ghost quiz before we go on to our first poltergeist. Are you ready? I don't know if everybody will recognize this one, but I like it. <laughs> Rent a ghost, wasn't that fantastic? Does anybody remember that? Who doesn't remember that, actually? Do you know what? Don't go and see it. It's probably hopelessly naff. You need to be about seven to see it for the first time. <laughs> but I used to like it. Uh, and also, Mr. Was it Mr. Who was, was it Mr. Claypole who was the, yeah, he was the jester. He was one of my first crushes. I was too young, <laughs> too young to realize he was totally gay. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. The, uh, the drummer of Tedworth was um, a story from what is now Tidworth in Wiltshire. And it is 18th century. Um, there was a local magistrate called John Mompesson, and he saw a ne'er-do-well called William Drury, who was an ex-regimental drummer, and he had his drum went round, presumably for a living, playing his drum. But he was also a bit of a shyster. He was known for um, hocus-pocus, feats of activity and such-like devices. He was also, he was actually caught and presented to the magistrate for carrying false documents, uh, potentially trying to extort money using them. So he was a ne'er-do-well. The magistrate sent him on his way, um, didn't punish him, but he did take his drum. And William Drury was very, very bitter about this indeed. Now, from that time when that drum was brought into Montpesson's house, strange things started to happen in the house. There was a strange and hollow sound, but no one could see anything, so it came oftener, five nights, and absent three. Um, the drum had been taken to Montpesson's mother's room within the house, and the reason that it had been put in there was because she liked to play with her grandchildren, and the grandchildren liked the drum. So the fact that there was a lot of phenomena around that room, perhaps it was the grandchildren? I don't know. It would make great hollow sounds so that the windows would shake in beds and consistently half an hour after they were in bed and stay almost two hours. So do you detect children being sent to bed and being a bit resentful and full of energy for two hours and then going to sleep? Because I do. Um, and then it would make chairs, tables, trunks and all movables walk up and down the rooms and then tumble down the stairs. There were also phenomena that we, that we would recognize utterly clearly as sleep paralysis. This shows that once the house was under this spell, the idea that there was a poltergeist, that there was a resentful spirit around, uh, people would take their experiences and then they would interpret them in the light of this spirit potentially being there. Uh, there was a stout fellow um, of sober conversation. For several nights, something would endeavor to pluck his clothes off the bed. Uh, now and then he should find himself forcibly held as if he were bound hand and foot. And other servants uh, were taken up in their bed, um, being lifted up to a great height and laid down softly again. 
and something lay on their feet with great weight. There was an apparition at the foot of the bed, um, the exact shape of proportion he could not discover, but he saw a great body with two red and glaring eyes, uh, which for some time were fixed steadily upon him, and then at length disappeared. There were seven or eight spectral human shapes. So who here has suffered from sleep paralysis and recognizes some of those descriptions? Yeah, me too. Um, and who here, just in an academic sense, because you're skeptics and you know about sleep paralysis, and that sounds familiar from the descriptions that you've read or heard. Yes, yeah, so we're lucky, really. I mean, we know about this in, in an academic sense. It actually helps if you know, if you have sleep paralysis, it helps to know that um, it's just a harmless sleep blip. It reduces the anxiety <coughs> and distress. But for these people, they didn't know about it. So for them, if the fact that they were living in the house of a poltergeist meant that this was a good explanation. The interesting thing, if this was the children, it was noted that while this poltergeist was afflicting this house, yet no dog would bark, so the dog couldn't detect the poltergeist. The dog wouldn't bark at the children either, so that's consistent with that. One of the, um, uh, one of Miss, um, the Montpessor's mother's friends said, uh, I would like it well if it would leave us some money to make a satisfaction for the trouble uh, that it puts us through. Um, the day before, her, one of her friends had told her about a fairy tale where uh, a fairy or a supernatural entity had put some money in the slippers of, um, uh, of, of a poor woman. And she, uh, she said that, and the next day, guess what happened? There were the sounds of clinking coins throughout the house. So whichever agent it was that was causing this poltergeist manifestation responded to the inputs. We see that later with the uh, Enfield poltergeist as well, that as soon as somebody mentions something, as soon as somebody tells something within the earshot of the children that is typical in these cases, that the next day or in the days following, these things happen. So the manifestations depend on the things that people are talking about. They found items in unusual places, uh, long piked iron in Montpesson's bed and that kind of thing. Um, somebody in the house, bear in mind this was a large house, there were many children, um, these were affluent houses which would have um, servants, people you know, living in as well. So it was a house where people were wandering around the place all, over, all the time. So it doesn't strike me as peculiar at all that anybody in that house could get items and put them in peculiar places. And the devil kept such a civilized schedule, it didn't bother anybody between 12 and 6. <laughs> it was the most civilized demon anyone's ever heard of in their lives. That was an illustration from um, a book called Sadducismus Triumphatus. And that was written by a man named Joseph Glanville. Joseph Glanville was um, a local uh, man. He was born to Puritan parents, but he became Church of England kind of more middle of the way um, in his uh, later life. And he wrote this book. It means Sadducees are, triumph, uh, are, are, tri are triumphing. And the Sadducees were the people in the Bible who denied the existence of the afterlife. He was very worried about this. So he wrote this whole book full of anecdotes proving that there are these are, there are these minor miracles, these things that happen day to day. He's not taking the Puritan line on things. He's saying that there is something that is actually going on in the world, and we can see it due to all of these anecdotes. Um, he, he's kind of regarded potentially as one of the fathers of psychical research because of the way that he collected these stories. Unfortunately, his standard for evidence was execrably low. I mean, um, and even by his peers, it was they, the standards were thought laughable. But that is how we get this story. It was written as an account in that. That's um, a picture of the frontispiece of that book. And it's interesting to notice his motivations because you can see from this next quote, he said, those that dare, bluntly, dare not bluntly say there is no God consent, content themselves to deny there are witches or spirits. So as far as he's concerned, denying that there are witches or spirits or fairies or whatever um, is the thin end of the wedge of atheism, which he took to be a great social ill, a great social evil. So... This, for him, is part of a supernatural universe which must be, which is self-evident and which must be adhered to because the alternative is anarchy, atheism and breakdown. Another ghost quiz. This is another one of my favourites. I don't know how many people get it, though. 
Motley Hall, yeah, the ghost of Motley Hall. Who does remember that? Is it just me and you? Oh, no, it's a few people. This was, this was actually quite good. I think it might stand up. Um, it was a kids' show in the 70s, and the idea that was that all of these ghosts lived in this hall. And uh, as far as I remember, what they did was they went round um, tormenting anybody who wanted to buy the hall because they wanted to leave it to themselves. The next example is the example of Epworth Rectory in Lincolnshire. That was, uh, that was a, this was a very short haunting, actually. This was only from December uh, 1716 to January 1717. Epworth Rectory... Epworth Lectury? <laughs> I don't know. Epworth Rectory was the home of Samuel and Susanna uh, Wesley. And Susanna Wesley was the daughter of a nonconformist minister. So again, we see these dissenting, sort of more radical ministers, this, um, this religiosity coming in. And one of their sons, they had 19 children, about half of them survived. One of their sons ended up being John Wesley, who created Methodism. And Methodism, uh, when it was first created, um, wasn't a separate church. It was, uh, it was a revival movement, uh, a returning back to basics movement within the Church of England. There's a picture of John Wesley. Now, what happened um, with... Uh, oh, I'll do that later. Yes, Old Geoffrey was named by a Wesley daughter. This started to happen, all of the, the knockings and uh, the normal poltergeist phenomena that you would accept, that you would expect. And it was called Old Geoffrey by Hetty, who was one of the Wesley daughters. Um, According to vulgar opinion, it boded any ill to me, I could not hear it, by Samuel Wesley. He said, so what he was saying was that if he couldn't hear it, it was possibly, uh, by, fault, by normal superstition, a sign that he was going to die. That's interesting because that's uh, also consistent with a lot of other types of supernatural creatures. If you have a banshee, for example, in Irish fairy mythology, then the person who's going to die can't hear the banshee, but everybody else can hear the wailing. Um, in the end, fortunately, uh, Samuel Wesley did hear the knockings and he also did survive, so that was fortunate. Um, I was entirely convinced that it was beyond the power of any human creature to make such strange and various noises, said Susanna Wesley. Um, and any of you who've been to Professor Chris French's uh, talks will know just how good human witnesses are. So um, I think that's a testament to that. So Hetty and the other children, she trembled exceedingly in her sleep, as she always did before the noise awakened her. It was commonly nearer her than the rest. Duh. Um, Hetty and two of her younger sisters were such affected through sleep, sweating and trembling exceedingly, and it happened around the children's bed, they trembled very much till it waked them. I mean, you, you kind of, you have to be utterly committed to the idea of a supernatural explanation, not to kind of think, ah, are the kids pranking? Um, it seemed obvious. That slide that I showed earlier was actually original letters to the Reverend John Wesley and his friends. And uh, it was detected by Joseph Priestley that Hetty's letters, which had been curated by John Wesley, actually were taken out of, of the whole account. He thinks that John Wesley knew that Hetty was, was faking and that her letters were taken out because it would, it would spoil the whole story. Locals had already caused some of the animals um, uh, hurt some of the, the uh, Wesley's animals and may have caused the rectory fires in 1702 and 1709. The rectory fire in 1709 actually completely destroyed the rectory. So that was really quite catastrophic. Um, and it meant that perhaps you could have children pranking, perhaps you even had the locals joining in, because there's some evidence of some really pretty malignant feeling against the family. This is a Canadian um, called Adlington Bruce, and he can be, he was around uh, the turn of the century, the, the turn of the 19th, 20th century, uh, and he was regarded as one of the first kind of promoters of proper psychology. He was around the time of William James, um, those kinds of things. He was a journalist, uh, but he also felt that this was uh, 
was just done by the children. He said, we are therefore justified in believing that this case, like so many others of its kind, the fallibility of human memory has played an overwhelming part in exaggerating the experiences actually undergone. He went through the original documents and then went through the documents that had been built on top of them, giving the just the story of the Epworth Rectory. And he thought that in that process, the stories had been pumped up for, um, for good value. He really felt that this was just a load of children pranking or a load of perfectly normal events. Um, and yet it had grown into this, this story, into this account. And here we have another similar kind of a quote um, to the one that we had from from um, Glanville, the giving up of witchcraft is, in effect, giving up the Bible. He thinks that if you give up belief in the supernatural, it's the thin end of the wedge to atheism and to anarchy. Robert Southey um, wrote a story, uh, wrote, he was Wesley's um, biographer, really. He said, a belief in witchcraft followed naturally from these premises. He invalidated his own authority by listening to the most absurd tales with implicit credulity and recording them as authenticated facts. So it's worth remembering that even at these times that not everybody was thinking the same way, at these times not everybody takes evidence at face value or believes in poltergeists. And in the case of both John Wesley and of Joseph Glanville, we have people contemporaneous or people who knew their documents very well, saying, my God, these guys were gullible. <coughs> the next ghost quiz, get ready. I think you're going to know this one. Randall Hopkirk. Who remembers that? Who enjoyed that? I thought it was superb. I thought it was wonderful. Um, there was something about TV in the 60s and 70s that was really, really sort of so inventive and, uh, uh, and they came up with some great ideas and I think this was one of them. <coughs> Does anybody know these ladies? The Fox Sisters, yes, a skeptic classic. Margaret, Kate and Leah Fox. Um, Margaret and Kate were the two youngest. Leah managed them later on in their lives. They came from upstate New York, from Hydesville. Excuse me. <coughs> And when they were kids, they used to prank. In fact, it's surprising that anybody actually paid any attention to them because the mechanism was so incredibly clear. Basically, they would get an apple. When we were at bed at night, we used to tie an apple to a string and move the string up and down, causing the apple to bump on the floor. Or we would drop the apple on the floor, making a strange noise every time it would rebound. Mother listened to this for a time. She would not understand it, and she wouldn't suspect us being capable of a trick because we were so young. Now, that was in 1888. That was a good long time after she was a child and after all of these things had happened. She actually recanted, and then she recanted again. She said that she actually really was what she said, a, a, a spiritual medium. Now, inadvertently, these children started out just by pranking. Their uh, mother referred this to a Quaker couple in the local area, and they did, the story ended up getting picked up by um, a local newspaper, and people ran with it. It probably didn't do them any good personally. They were very young women, and they were taken off to all sorts of functions, um, probably didn't have the childhood they should be. We all know what happens to child stars, don't we? Uh, they're very lucky to survive psychologically. In the event, the two of them drank very heavily. In fact, Kate drank so heavily later on in her life that her sisters were worried about her children. <coughs> so they became famous. They became the Fox sisters. And they weren't poltergeist channelers. They were mediums. They would bring the messages of the dead through to the living. Now, if we're to look at the context here and to work out why this happened, we can see that in all of these cases that there have been, first of all, you start with, you start with a very small phenomenon. You start with somebody doing something, somebody creating, you know, knocking or banging or whatever. Then what you get is an amplifier, somebody who comes in with the clout, with the credibility, 
to magnify the whole situation. Somebody, a middle class, usually man, walks in and says, yes, these are just children and this is just little knockings, but what it means is so and so, and then they get out to the world at large. And then in addition to the initial stimulus and the amplifier, you need a society which is receptive to that message at that time. In the case of the Fox sisters, we can see that the religious environment was receptive. The Second Great Awakening, um, has anyone heard of that? American historians here? The Second Great Awakening, um, this is an illustration of what they called the burnt open states. It was at the beginning of the 19th century, and it was really a very charismatic return to religiosity. Those states that are colored in there, it's now recognized that this is, that was thought of as the great burnt over district. In, in actual fact, this movement spread a great deal further than that, and it's thought that the religiosity at the time, was, it was kind of ambient, really. This wasn't just restricted to that particular area. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it was, it was a time when you see in films, when you see preachers, charismatic preachers, standing in a tent and uh, performing you know, charismatic uh, kinds of sermons and people falling to the ground. That was that kind of era, those kinds of events that they're referring to. Uh, there was the Quakers and the Shakers and the Shaker Makers. Oh, you spotted that. I'm glad you are awake. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I made the last one up. Uh, but Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh Day Adventists, uh, Mormons, this is where, this is the crucible that those people were formed in. Um, it was a very intense and revivalist kind of religiosity. Interestingly, when you get religious movements like this, and there's no religious movements that are more respectable than another, you kind of get them. To begin with, you have to have a prophet, you have to have somebody who has the charisma to get people to join him. And it's because it usually is a him. Um, and he can't be so far out and so possessed by God that he can't connect with people and give out his message properly. Uh, but, you know, he can, he can get together a group of people. What happens to the organization after that time when he dies? Because it very rarely manages to be passed down the generations. You need somebody as charismatic, as capable of pulling people together. Well, then a religion tends to ossify, tends to have more hierarchies, more institutions. Um, you get something like uh, the Catholic Church, where you have qualifications, in effect, um, where you have uh, qualifications passed on from one person to another. You're not dependent on this one charismatic prophet. So you can see different types of religiosity really as um, different stages in the evolution of a religious movement. And a lot of these religious movements, which are now very hierarchical and set, started off with these charismatic preachers. <coughs> Although the Second Great Awakening was mostly over by the middle of the century, in many ways we grow up in the ambience of our parents' childhood. And this would have been part of the ambience of the Fox sisters' childhood. As also they were coming to do all of their performances, the American Civil War had happened. It had been absolute carnage. A lot of people had lost their lives. And people wanted to get in touch with them. If you have someone who has the power to get in touch with your dead son who has just died in a trench somewhere, you will do it. So by 1897, spiritualism had many followers. This, bear in mind, is after... Um, uh, the recantation of 1888. They could confess that they had faked it, but it had such a momentum that it was way beyond the initial prophets doing anything about it. Interestingly, it was a phenomenon of the middle and the upper class. For me, I see that slightly actually as actually, um, it's very familiar with new age movements. New age movements generally tend to be by, with people who, they have enough confidence they can step out of the ranks and they can say, actually, I know how to do this. Um, I know all about this. They can pick and choose their spirituality. They can take what they want. Apart from anything else, they're the only people who can afford to pay too much for the stupid therapies. They were also, <coughs> many prominent, prominent spiritualists were female. And at that time, suffrage was a big issue. And so this was a way, if you were a woman, of getting a standing in society. 
And they were also very much involved with radical clauses such as the freedom of slaves um, and of women's suffrage. Now, John Wesley and Joseph Glanville at their times as well had also been interested in things like prison conditions and um, uh, freedom of slaves. So these, these movements are generally socially progressive. One more ghost quiz. I think this is the last ghost quiz, ghost quiz before we finish. So you ready for this one? A bit more than that, please. Yes. Yes. OK, here we go. The ghost and Mrs. Muir. The ghost and Mrs. Muir. And if you haven't seen Rent a Ghost, don't get, don't get it on download. Don't pay for the DVDs. If you haven't seen this one, this version of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, do anything you can to go and see it. It's absolutely wonderful. A classic, very touching film. Let's come up to date with the Enfield poltergeist. Um, I ended up meeting Janet Winter, as she now is, who was at the centre of the Enfield poltergeist phenomena, with Guy Lyon Playfair, who, um, was, who was there investigating the phenomena at the time. Uh, did anyone see that, that TV segment? Yeah. <coughs> If you, ever, if you want to know what I think about the Enfield Poltergeist, Google Deborah Hyde, Guardian, Enfield Poltergeist. I did an article in The Guardian, and it kind of covers everything. And actually, all you have to do is to read This House is Haunted. Uh, you can write in Sharpie yourself. Underneath that, it isn't. Um, <laughs> and anything that you, uh, when, as you read through the book, you know, you just go, uh, uh, The people who investigated it, uh, Morris Gross, very, a lovely avuncular kind of a bloke uh, involved with the Society for Psychical Research. But he'd lost his daughter in a motorcycle accident and became very interested in the potential for life after death after that. Um, Guy Lyon Playfair had spent some time in Brazil with some uh, manifestations, uh, some charismatic cults and that kind of thing. He still, he at this point, when we met in the studio, he had just sold the rights to um, the Enfield Poltergeist, and he, I think he was very keen on it being promoted and getting out there so that the film could actually be made. Uh, <coughs> Janet was, I thought, I found her to be a very nice lady, very quiet, very nervous, and she didn't look like she was enjoying herself at all. When we were in the green room, um, I, I, I don't know what possessed her. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, to, to come on the telly because it didn't seem to suit her personality um, and I, I, I suspect she would probably just like to leave the whole sorry thing behind uh, but it was a big thing at the time bear in mind that in the 60s and 70s we were going through a bit of a religious revival of our own in many ways because we were interested in crop circles, in aliens, uh, in the power of pyramids. The 60s and 70s were a great time to read lurid paperbacks, and you can buy them all now for 50p each, and they are a hoot, so you should. Um, and this, is, this happened in that context. Uh, interestingly, at the end of the book, Playfair gives some advice as to what you should do if you are plagued with a poltergeist in your house. And he very, he very, succinctly points out that Kramer has observed that poltergeists never seem to attack atheists <laughs> and the beliefs of their families involved may well influence the course of events. Uh. <laughs> <coughs> so what he was going for there was clearly the idea that the, the mechanism was some kind of, um, uh, you, you know, that there was some kind of primal force was coming through Janet and it wasn't perceived by physics, but that didn't mean that it didn't exist. He wasn't going through the demonic explanation. But really, I mean, God, the explanation was right in front of his eyes and he deliberately rejected it. So that's, that really is very special. So I think that we can see now that what you really need for a typical poltergeist event is one of these. Oh, God, no, sorry, that's the wrong slide. One of these. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't think that teenage girls, usually girls, can produce um, a very convincing and malignant phenomenon, and that 
fully grown adults won't believe them, then all I can say is you haven't read much history. On the, this morning that I was on with uh, Guy Lyon Playfair, one of his objections was, do you really think a couple of girls could have persuaded a man like me? And I said, well, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle fell for the Cottingley Fairies, and he invented deductive reasonings poster boy, Sherlock Holmes. I didn't say the second sentence because I didn't want to be rude, but really, um, we only need to look at history. At the top left-hand side there, that's an illustration of the Witches of War Boys. Uh, in 1589 to 1592, uh, there was a woman called Alice Samuel in War Boys in Cambridgeshire. And she and her husband and her daughter ended up getting caught um, in the psychodrama of uh, a family next door. Alice Samuels and her family were fairly poor. The, drama, the, the family who lived next door had just moved in and they were very wealthy. Um, and there was the young girl, the eight-year-old girl, was, was truly ill and she accused Alice of bewitching her. But it was a kind of a, a contagion which ended up affecting all of the other siblings, including one boy, and 12 maidservants. They would all say that they had pins being put in them, that they were being afflicted by a demon, and that Alice Samuels was the witch who had set this demon onto them. They would do things, they would have extreme uh, contortions. Um, they, they would be uh, sort of doing backstands where they're, it's the kind of thing that you would associate with grand mal seizures, actually. So this, this psychological contagion went around this family, starting from an eight-year-old girl. These were, all, well, these were all girls, women under 20. Um, Alice Samuels, her husband and her daughter, ended up being executed for witchcraft. So this is serious stuff. The next one is uh, the Mora trials in Sweden, a series of 17th century trials, where children were put in front of adults, a bunch of children, and they would accuse the adults who they had seen of flying to devil's sabbats on the, I think it was, um, I think it was cattle rather than horses of the local farmer. And they, they directly led to deaths. Uh, the third example here that I've picked out is the Pendle Witches, which started with a young girl called Janet Davis, who was very young. She was the, witness, the chief witness for the prosecution against her members of her own family. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and there, there were two warring, again, very poor, poor people, two warring uh, families. They, they probably subsisted, basically, on doing cunning women-type uh, trades. They would, they would do minor spells, medicine, that kind of thing. And she was a member of one of those families, and the whole thing got completely out of hand. Twelve people ended up getting involved in that and executed, um, and she was chief witness for the prosecution. Down here we have... Um, the Salem Witches, 1692, that was started off with um, a slave girl called Tichuba and uh, a load of other girls too. The whole thing got completely out of hand. Again, you do need a context. There were, um, there were land and contract issues there. Um, it, it, was, it was a lot bigger than that. But the fire started with young girls being witnesses against older people. And of course, the Cottingley Fairies, the one that we all know about, and we can't believe he fell for. But then again, you know, Conan Doyle was, as much as he invented Sherlock Holmes, he was personally distressed himself. He'd lost a son in the, in the First World War. He was interested in spiritualism for a good long time before that. So people can maintain these kind of opposing beliefs in the one head, in the one personality, quite happily. So... What I hope we have found is that poltergeists probably don't exist. <laughs> they might, but we do a great deal more to understand really the context in which people create these, um, these events and this, this notion, this model, if you like, uh, of how the universe works. We know that children aren't beyond being tricksters. Uh, we know that gullible adults aren't beyond coming in and lending their clout, lending their social status uh, into magnifying the subject. And we know that under some circumstances, perfectly responsible, respectable people have a certain type of religiosity which motivates them to believe that spirits and miracles are happening in the world around us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank Do you. Have questions? Or do you want to? I think we are out of time. We've only got well, four minutes left of questions. Uh, does anyone have a uh, short question? I'll grab the microphone. Um, make an orderly cue if you have any questions. And we'll be able to do that. Um, uh, you're looking very scared. No questions about rent -a -go, No questions. Please, it's been yeah. a few years. We won't let you leave for lunch unless you ask a question. Um, uh, any, any, oh, yeah, there's one, someone racing up from the front. Oh, oh, oh. we don't have time for politeness. Stop being so polite, skeptics. Uh, which of these voices that you mentioned do you think would have uh, had the most influence at a time? The most influence at the time um, was the most influence at the time of the three examples that I've taken, uh, the Fox Sisters. It started off a whole new religion which still exists. Uh, people still believed fervently in it even when they recanted um, 30 years later. Uh, and the, the momentum of it completely um, outran them. Of, of, so, of those three, yeah. So, no, the Methodists. <laughs> oh, there are Methodists, but his religion wasn't predicated on the poltergeist activity at Epworth yeah. Rectory. Yeah. But, yeah, but nonetheless, you're right. I mean, he was tremendously well, influential. But your Red figure. Fox sisters probably have a bigger, wider reach in the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One more question. As you've shown, um, uh, there are self-proclaimed experts in this field as well. Um, that you, you mentioned a couple yes. of ex examples. But have there been any, um, well, I would say scientifically a bit more sound kind of examination of any of these stories? Uh, so uh, is there anything that, that at least s s looks a bit strange uh, from, from your sp perspective? Thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Still got two minutes on the clock. We can have another question. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been really <laughs> lovely. And I'm so glad that people recognise the ghosts in Motley Hall and Rent a Ghost. Thank you very much. Yes, Rent a Ghost. That was my favourite. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, we got a couple of messages.